So um, let's get started. This is the title of the talk, and I'm grateful to the opportunity for having the chance to try to kind of gather together some of the things that I've learnt while working for Alt and before. For those who are not connected with the association, and they're bound to be people in the room who aren't, I stopped being chief executive of ALT in May. And for the past couple of years, my credit card with its expiry date on the 7th of July, which I've used most days, has reminded me that by the 7th of this year, July this year, I'd have got a changed kind of work situation. And this is my 12th ALT conference. And it's the last one in which I have had any kind of production role and a minor one at that. So this is a sort of reflection that is, I was asked to make it personal and that's what I'm gonna do. These are the points or the areas I'm intending to cover. You can read them. And I intended to include some credits and references at the end, but I ran out of time, but I'll put them on later. So what got me into it? The older I get, the more I realize that you this I hadn't expected to happen at all the more I realize that you need to know about people's antecedents so I'll have to jump this very weird I should, I'm going to do it, yeah. yeah, if I can. My dad left Berlin in 36 and came via that geographical route to London in 46. My mum left Uruguay in 45, arriving in London then. And you can see where I've lived. And I finished up in Sheffield in 76. In 76, I followed friends to Sheffield and I got drawn into the work of an organization called the British Society for Social Responsibility in Science, which had at that time a two sort of strands of work. One was against chemical and biological warfare and new means of social and political control. And the other was in relation to work hazards and I got a dream job in 1979 at Granville College in Sheffield and my role was to develop and run courses about occupational safety and health for trade union representatives. This will make you smile. Um, anybody here who works for or has worked for Sheffield Hallam University? So on the left is Bill Owen, after whom your, Bill, your Owen building is named, and who was chair of the Sheffield Education Committee and chair of the governing body at Sheffield City Polytechnic before it became Sheffield Hallam. And in the center is Len Murray, who was the general secretary of the TUC in 1981. This is the opening of Sheffield Trade Union Studies Center. And in the background is some 1981 learning technology, which you, some people in this room will never even have seen, but a rollerboard uh, was what we had to work with. Some of my students. This is Maurice Birch, who was at that time, he was conv convener on the building of the flue gas desulfurization plant at Drax power station. 
talking to Greg Douglas, who was an official in the construction and engineering union. This is Betty, I don't remember her second name, who was a Newpee shop steward in the laundry at Northern General Hospital. Kay Bergen of Nalgo, who now part of Unison, led a very long strike in Sheffield Council against the introduction of what were then called quaintly visual display units. Um, and I always remember her as having done that. And they negotiated an agreement that limited the minimum size of screens that they were allowed to work on, diagonal size and built in breaks of 20 minutes for every hour of use of their, their, their device. Anyway, it didn't last very long. So now the connection with learning technology. This is the mouth of the Vieja tunnel that goes under the Pyrenees, under the Pyrenees' highest mountain. It was the longest tunnel, road tunnel in the world until 1964, five, over five kilometers. And I biked to it and through it in 85 with my friend and colleague, Andy Fairclough. Um, he worked for the TUC Education Service and I worked in the Trade Union Studies Centre in Sheffield. And um, it was 160 miles to get to the tunnel from where we'd stayed the previous day, very up and down. And on that day, we had a very long conversation on the kind of flat bits um, about technology and its use by union representatives um, for organizational purposes. And essentially, that's, that's when I kind of first started to think about these issues. I got drawn in by the TUC into developing training materials for trade union representatives in their use of technology. And a bit later on, I was asked to represent the TUC in making and running an online course pre-web. This is early 90s for shop stewards in Denmark, Sweden, and the UK about European integration. And I think anyone that's been involved in online distance learning would relate to this um, which is a posting by a learner and I'd like you to read it and I th hope you can you read it at the back because if you can't I'll read it out you can read it yeah okay. And I think it's not too extreme to say that this posting had a very, very sort of strong effect on how I thought that tech learning technologies, as I now know it to be called, could have a, an influence, a beneficial one on teaching and learning. And this caused me to start banging on about it in a very sort of energetic way everywhere I could. There's a, a, a phrase that the squeaky wheel gets the most oil. And the upshot was that I got a job in the same institution, which by then was the largest FE college in Europe, or claimed that it was the largest FE college in Europe, as its learning technology development manager, with the added advantage that I reported directly to the principal, which is a completely unstandard way of operating. But it meant that I was able to get things done for a period of time. And the first thing that we got done was the creation of a course called Learning to Teach Online. Um, this was post-web, but only just post-web. And it was an online, a wholly online course about how to be an online tutor. And it was very successful, particularly due to the input of several people who 
in a perverse way, later became very involved in the association, including Fred Pickering, the treasurer, who those of you at the AGM will have seen yesterday, and Dick Moore, who is a trustee now of ours, and a woman called Julia Dogleby, who was closely involved in the creation of the certified membership scheme that Alt now has. And very unusually, we had, um, and we decided to do this, we had tutors delivering this course in Canada and in Australia, as well as in the UK. So we had all three time zones covered. And this was, this sort of meant that learners could get very, very good support wherever they were based. And we got a lot of international students as a, as a result of it. The other thing that Lettol had, and I think Jonathan Darby will relate to this and others in the room, was a very unusual copyright statement, which I put on it as a sort of whim. I had control, so I thought, and I'd, there had been a, an article in The Economist featuring David Wiley, who was then in his early 20s, who'd invented or come up with this thing called an open content license, which kind of appealed to me. So I put an open content license on the Lettol course, which, and this open content license is a kind of, is the precursor of a Creative Commons license many years before Creative Commons became an organization and was created. And as a result of that, I kind of always known that you can make your content open and it doesn't cause people to steal it. Um, and this course was very successful. It was making lots and lots of money and we were public about that fact, but nobody ever nicked the materials. They wouldn't have been nicking them. We made we allowed them to because the thing that we were doing well, which they couldn't really nick, was a kind of approach to managing it, to running it, to building the team, to getting the whole thing to hang together. And for that reason, uh, I think that what this was proving was that be relaxed about openness. There were spin-offs, and this is topical. Um, in 2002, and by that time I didn't work for the Sheffield College, I'd left, just left, I'd been made redundant uh, in a sort of amicable way. The Sheffield College ran an English GCSE online course, and if you've any familiarity with exam rates that have been published now, um, those are astonishingly good GCSE results. and they're continued uh, to this day to be achieving those kinds of pass rates and grade rates on their online GCSE course. Um, I put a link there to the first faltering issue of my fortnightly mailing, which, because I was out of work and intending to be a, an independent consultant for as long as that was the option, um, I produced fortnightly mailing and it was just Googling for the, these results that I landed yesterday on me reporting the results from two, two, 2002. So um, anyway, so that year I um, was working as an independent and this job came up with Alt as its executive secretary, a half-time post that I knew fitted my experience like a glove. And I'm not going to now go into kind of history of my working for Alt because it would be boring as hell. And I'm also um, eight minutes behind the planned scheduled point at this point. So I'm going to sort of switch forward and really race through this. Meanwhile, I think it's important for you to see sort of other things that were going on. These are snapshots. I did a lot of mountain walking. Um, the dog owner cared about his Alsatian's eyes at this hut in the Pyrenees and had him with snow goggles on, the warden of the hut. I've done a load of Nordic skiing as much as I possibly can. And I do want to just dwell on this because I'm at the front here. This is climbing Norway's highest mountain, Glitterheim. I'm at the front, but I'm keeping very clear of the edge. And I think that's uh, a, a kind of bit of advice for managers, really. Um, just uh, stay clear of the edge. My kids became young men. Unlike me and their mother, they're kind of creatives 
of a particular kind. Um, and during this period, we had six administrations uh, who varied very widely in, how shall I say, how, how good they've been. Um, so now to some sort of technological stuff. Along this period, Moore's Law, this is Gordon Moore's original sketch from 65, showing how the price of transistors had fallen and how he predicted it would fall in the future. Moore's Law has been ticking away and is the reason why we have the web in its current form. I, I just this quote from last month, this is a, from an article that Peter Norvig and Udi Mamba wrote in the Google search blog. Google, Peter Norvig has spoken at a uh, conference here in 2007, and I have had a kind of vague association with him since that time. And I just think this is an astonishing, when you read this sentence, it's an absolutely astonishing um, a representation of Moore's law in action. That, and not just, I mean, you think the computing that got the Apollo to the moon, but this is the computing that got the whole Apollo program from end to end. So it's an even more astonishing statement. Now to some of the things I've learned. It's a disconnected list. And, when you're preparing a talk like this, you always put too much effort into the front and then you get to the, this bit and you just have to kind of throw it together in, in a way which is sense of which I've done. So first thing is the terms of engagement really do matter. And by that I mean the, the dignity of the doers, the issues like credit and attribution, pay when pay is due, and rarely being unbending if you're running something. Roy P's diagram really stuck in my mind when I saw him give a talk representing it. This is that learning is life-wide and lifelong, and that the proportion of the time that learners spend in formal learning is absolutely tiny in comparison to the proportion that they spend in life-wide and lifelong learning. There are some dreadful models of learning out there, of which this is one, the kind of squirting it into the brain model. Two key points here, learners, not teachers, not content, create the learning. And I'd like in the next three minutes, I'm gonna use bits of the next three minutes to dwell on just for you to have time to read these two fantastic statements, one made at the 2007 Out Conference, as it happens. There are such things as cornerstone ideas and depending on what your work area is, you need to find them. Those two from Herb Simon and Dylan William are examples, but Bloom's No Significant Difference is another one, Lorillard's Conversational Framework, Mazur's Peer-Based Learning. And you need to find them and sort of stick with them. And don't assume that only the new is a cornerstone. I'm going to jump quite a long way. Um, to say, and it's really a connected point, that there are such people as deep and leading thinkers who are worth seeking out and reading and, or listening to. You shouldn't feel kind of ashamed about having that sense that there are people who are worth taking account of. And I've listed, I put a couple there who personally I found to be incredibly influential. One who many of you will have heard of, David Weinberger. But I guess many of you will never have heard of Richard Skemp because his work in the 60s is pre-internet. Although there is a website with some fantastic videos of his 
investigations of how children learn, but he just has sort of dropped from view. And I think that's a terrible thing that people who have got their heads around things that absolutely matter for the design of learning, just people to sort of reinvent the same ideas uh, and we need to not have that happen. This is a flippant point coming up um, and I'm gonna stop because time has run out uh, in, in a second, which is that people find brain images and neuroscience language more convincing um, than, result, than results that make no reference to the brain. So watch out for uh, scientific papers with brain images. You're being, you're being uh, changed, drawn away. So what I was then going to do was talk about what we need now to do. And I'm going to just give these 15 seconds each. This is a photo of somebody in a rare earth mine. Rare earths are central to the functioning of mobile phones. Be patient. The drive for world-class competitiveness as a policy objective will dissipate. In fact, it already has been dropped from the biz business plan if you look at the 2012 version, although it was there in 2011 writ large. I think we should push instead for world-class collaborativeness. I just think that's a much more productive thing to be doing. And to have the confidence to bring our community's knowledge and experience to bear on the wider educational world. Do things at the right scale, which I think points to using other people's services wherever possible because they're able to organize them at the right scale. And there is this slide um, in the presentation, which is take too long to explain, but it's got enough um, notes to it uh, in the bit that will be on the web for you to make sense of it. And I would be interested to get your feedback on it. Thank you.